In fact, uh, it's a very important flagship program of the IAGS. Having the most eminent achievers and the most eminent personalities in the field of minimally invasive surgery and endoscopy, sharing their lifetime experience, sharing their learnings, which have been very hard way learned for the benefit of the youngsters, for the benefit of the practicing minimally invasive surgeons in India and across the globe. I also warmly welcome the president of the IAGS, Dr. Sunil Papal sir, and the faculty for this evening, none other than our senior most <coughs> presidents of the IAGS, able advisor, trustee, and he has held almost all the positions and this point of time, he is the chief editor of the JMAS. Dr. Chobe sir is known to everyone and he will be introduced by none other than the most eminent gastroenterologist surgeon, our able treasurer, Satyapriya D. Sarkar. Followed by, we will be having Dr. G. V. Rao interacting, uh, sharing his experience. And he will be interviewed by Satyapriya. Dr. Sumit Shah will be sharing the platform with Dr. Chobe sir. So that is the plan for this evening. With that, now I hand over the day's proceedings to Dr. Sumit Shah. Dr. Sumit Shah, over to you to introduce Dr. Chobe. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kanakvel. Thank you, IAGS, for giving me this opportunity to be with all of you today. The task given to me is both very simple and it is also very difficult. Because it is simple because uh, Dr. Chobe needs no introduction and everybody in the country and, uh, uh, and of course, around the world of minimal access surgery knows Dr. Pradeep Chobe. He is a legend in the field of minimal access surgery. He is a mentor for uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, laparoscopic surgeons uh, around the world. And uh, he has held almost all eminent positions everywhere, including being uh, the past president, trustee of Indian Association of Gastrointestinal Endosurgeons, and of course, of so many other societies. Uh, if I will introduce all the positions that Dr. Chaube has held, and then probably I'll take away his entire time of his talk, which I definitely am not going to do. But Sir is also my mentor and uh, Chairman of the Department of Minimal Access, Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery at Max Healthcare, New Delhi. Uh, it's just a great privilege and honor, sir, to introduce to you, introduce you to this audience. And I request you to please uh, go ahead and enlighten us for the topic of the today. Uh, that is the minimal access hernia surgery. Dr. Chaubi, thank please. Thank you very much, Sumit. And thank you, uh, Sunil and uh, our other colleagues. Uh, for giving this opportunity. I always feel delighted and I always feel very excited about uh, meeting all of you and also discussing whatever we have uh, sort of gained during these last three decades of uh, minimal access surgery. And uh, our generation has been very, very fortunate to have witnessed uh, this uh, revolution. Hernia being a very uh, interesting and common subject and also the area which has uh, been sort of debated right from the word go. So I would like to share my uh, slides here. Okay, so of course I uh, bring uh, the greetings from our Institute of Minimal Access. And today we are talking about evolution and future of laparoscopic hernia surgery and of course we know that I will not be still be able to complete that but I just thought that I will be touching on some of the aspects which I feel are important and may not be discussed as frequently uh, or as commonly as I would like to discuss. I think these are the two famous uh, 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 very very tiny small uh, statues or you can say or sculptures whatever you these are the, from the stone age and of decades and decades and hundreds of years back and if you see that left one the colored one has got a umbilical hernia depicted that means the umbilical hernia was part of that lady who has been um, uh, sort of depicted here 
and on the other side is again a very old um, uh, uh, stone carving where it shows possibly inguinal hernia or maybe a femoral hernia because that is also a female uh, depiction so i think it is one of the uh, first images which now have become important because they show that the hernia is a as a problem i think i will be touching very few points today because as i said that you know it's such a vast subject i thought that i will play some important uh, uh, slides uh, for uh, uh, talking about the wall hernias one important thing which we have seen in the literature that if you see on the left side you have about 1985 to 88 survey which shows inguinal hernia is a very uh, important and common hernia of course but at the same time we have uh, another uh, uh, survey which was done between 2005 and 2008 which you see that percentage wise not that the frequency of inguinal hernia has gone down but proportionately it has gone down and why it is so i think it is the rise in the incisional hernia which includes the parastomal hernia because a lot of the benign conditions um, of the colon uh, um, the hernia the ostomies are done the lot of uh, oncological um, conditions where they are living longer now so we have the parastomal hernias coming in of course we know that the femoral etc proportionately are showing downward trend but if i have to conclude this slide i would say that the number of hernias have increased uh, phenomenally in last couple of decades and the maximum increase has been on the side of the incisional and parastomal hernia and that is the reason why it shows that the percentage of the inguinal hernia has gone a little bit less but the numbers have actually gone well i think the literature we just keep on talking it's like a pendulum we talk about the management of hernia is just a pendulum swinging from castration and putting the patient upside down on a on a board to to cure hernia i think we have come to a stage which is at the moment a gold standard and we talk about the uh, tension free repair now if you see what is i think is very important i think what is our goal when you deal with abdominal wall hernia what you are going to do either you are going to repair or you are wanting to go beyond the repair which is a point which needs uh, deliberation when you want to repair and when you want to go towards the reconstruction for hernia well i think if you see it is to close that defect of course there is no doubt about that uh, and it is to restore the shape and deformity whatever is there which may not be always possible when you have the huge hernias it may not be possible to resort to that deformity but i would always mention that anybody who is not bothered about the deformity of the body with large massive hernias i think we should not really pay that much attention and of course the recurrence has to be uh, prevented and in last about two decades i think we are talking about the chronic pain so it is not only the recurrence but our attention is drawn towards the chronic pain that they, sh they should not have so finally we can conclude now that it is a tension free uh, concept of hernia it has become a golden rule and you are supposed to be using a prosthetic repair so the tissue repair practically is has receded and we talk about a tension free prosthetic repair so called the gold standard at the moment but apart from that i think the previously the we were moving rather slow with the 21st century i think is a uh, hernialogy has changed from so called hernia surgery into a, a full fledged subject of herniology and we today we are talking about herniologists who are dedicating their work practice and their uh, research and and their clinical work towards hernia and we are very proud that uh, india has been on the forefront uh, in last two decades uh, in the field of endoscopic repair of hernia and we have played very vital role our indian colleagues in formulating the guidelines in the 
world and also talking about this this is i think uh, is about this slide is somewhere around i think 94 95 it was in delhi and some of uh, the believers of hernia are there you can see ben david you can see the, uh, uh, the famous bitner you can see kokleta you can see professor ma so these are the the believers which we thought that possibly so first uh, laparoscopic uh, hernia workshop was done in 94 uh, at uh, uh, gangaram hospital so i think you know the some believers and i think we got together first time on uh, february 19th to 21st in delhi uh, in 2009 uh, bitner and us we got that we should prepare the technical guidelines for hernia surgery because previously, I think the European Hernia Societies were talking about the guidelines, but we thought that we should uh, collect the herniologists in the world, periodically talk about it, and that is the beginning. And we are very fortunate and, and we are honored that it started in, in India. And then we came with the guidelines for TP, and this is you know surgical endoscopy. If you're interested, I think you can go on to these uh, uh, guidelines. So this was which we published, and it was very well uh, accepted uh, across and quoted. And then we moved on to the ventral hernia and incisional hernia, part two, part three. We have talked about the, uh, again, because incisional hernia uh, is, is more a complex subject. Then we went into the uh, another uh, uh, revision for the head. So these are all guidelines which are already there uh, in part uh, in various literature. I will be just touching some of important aspects. We talk about obesity because obesity is increasing. We know that the ventral abdominal wall hernias in obese patients have got a typical uh, problems and conditions and we know that obesity increases the risk of complications uh, with uh, ventral hernia and abdominal for hernia and as you can see in this chart as the bmi increases the chances of the complication also increases with bmi of course uh, many of them will be diabetic and will have comorbidity so whenever you are dealing with the ventral hernia for obese patients please try to assess your strength your muscle power and remember that it, these are the high risk patients so you should assess your strength also when you are dealing with the high risk patients. You, the cost is likely to go, the anesthesia risks are high, the chances of recurrences are very high, mesh infection is high because of the comorbid conditions and the un uncontrolled diabetic status in some patients will have more pain and they will be mobilizing themselves rather late. So be careful with obese patients. Same thing comes because we know that the incidence of diabetes is increasing. I think the diabetic patients also will pose because you are using a prosthesis. So whenever you are using a prosthesis, I'm sure the diabetic patients' behavior will be different. They will go into all sort of hyperglycemia, poor wound healing, surgical site infections, UTI, because you catheterize them. And that is the reason why we see that uh, 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 surgical site infection will be higher and also we have made a protocol and which is accepted all across the world now that uh, hb even see more than eight in a diabetic patient you should not be repairing the hernia and you should not put for that matter any processes may it be hernia mesh may it be joints or maybe any other sort of repair should be avoided another challenge is i think you know uh, maybe we are facing it a little less, but some of our colleagues must be facing it large. It's a large hernia. What is a large hernia? It's very difficult to define. There's no uh, uniform way of classifying it, but um, any hernia which is the defect is more than 15 centimeters, that is about six inches, is considered as a large hernia. Some studies mention about more than 10 centimeters, but I thought I must mention it here and roughly if you are talking about the square meter so the fist is about more than 
100 uh, square meet uh, centimeter and the palm size is about more than 150 centimeter square centimeter so this is a gross way of looking whether it's a small hernia or a big hernia but when we talk about in a true sense the if the volume of hernia is greater than 30 percent of the abdominal uh, volume that is may be considered as a large hernia and if you do a ct scan you can see that a lot of a lot of viscera has gone into uh, the sac and that is the situation which is called the loss of domain and it's almost about 50 percent of the viscera is outside so when there is a loss of domain and when you put these intestines back into the abdomen and repair the abdominal wall there are chances that you may find it very, very difficult or maybe rather Im Im impossible to put all the contents back and it will need to a very high intra-abdominal pressure and the patient may not be able to breathe and may go for a respiratory decomposition and also uh, and serious uh, wound deletions may there and sometimes you may land up with a situation where you have to undo because many of them go into the uh, compartmental uh, abdominal compartment syndrome which needs to be taken care of otherwise uh, re increases the mortality and of course we talk i'm sure all these uh, universities today are, uh, on on the digital uh, media and the social media will tell you uh, how to put uh, botulinum or botox and how to prepare these abdomen so anybody dealing with the large hernias should know these protocols and should be uh, using them with judicial uh, this thing but i think you know for a hernia like this where you see the the skin is absolutely thinned out there's a large hernia so this is skin is generally of no use and it needs to be excised apart from approximation and that is where i think very strongly i feel that we should go in for the hybrid approach which is a combination of conventional as well as the laparoscopic approach and i see a lot of future about it so what is the hybrid approach you do the diagnostic laparoscopy you try to reduce the content and then you know you go out and then repair or make excise that is skin whatever is redundant and close the defect and place the mesh laparoscopically because when you place the mesh laparoscopically you can put a wider mesh uh, a bigger mesh and you can fix it all around so even if the mesh contracts still you will have the uh, hernial orifices uh, the opening well covered so i form in cases of iform hybrid approach is definitely uh, scores over many other types of approach but i would like to explain here just the the way the patient feel i think the bigger the hernia bigger are the expectation this i know it's quite ironical because the patient is not bothered about the hernia not getting repaired and becoming big and big causing you know obstruction and also irreducibility but unfortunately they will give you more problem because their expectation is unrealistic so be careful because the bigger the hernia bigger is the problem second thing i would uh, like to touch on that you should avoid putting on concomitant meshes in some of the surgeries commonly performed so infected gallbladder where there is a spillage of bile appendicitis if there is a hernia uh, after doing appendicectomy avoid hysterectomy because you are opening the vagina or suturing the vagina so it's a, a sort of potentially contaminated situation and while you have enterotomies or i we strongly believe that even in bariatric surgery because you are handling the, the bowel and bowel contents uh, are there so sometimes we are not in favor of putting any mesh in bariatric patients now i am coming to the modern thinking i think you know with all these things you keep on is a is a is a is a puzzle now i think hernia because i think not many things moved in last decade so i think the present decade or the previous decade i would say i started talking about the newer 
so-called methods of this thing to repair the hernia. And we also thought the same way. And if you see this, uh, our publication, which was in 2003, uh, we published the laparoscopy ventral hernia repair with the extra peritoneal mesh, the technique and our early results. So I think you can, uh, you can very well um, imagine that almost uh, 2020, because this study started in 2000. So I think almost about 21 years back, we started putting the mesh outside the peritoneum and we published this uh, uh, literature and we had uh, less number of patients, but this is one of the first literature available of going out, putting the mesh outside the abdominal cavity. Now I would like to spend a couple of minutes because I think as a general surgeon, we moved on to abdominal wall without actually studying the abdominal wall muscle. So uh, I know that um, this will take away quite a bit of my presentation, but I thought this is one point which is not generally uh, uh, told to our young colleagues. And I thought that it's better that we recapitulate and revise our uh, anatomy a little bit, you know. So now you see, if you look at the abdominal muscle, the there are anatomical groups. So these are flat muscles, which are external oblique, internal oblique, and uh, transversalis. Then there are vertical muscles, rectus abdominis and pyramidalis. So there are flat muscles and there are vertical muscles. So this is the anatomic group. Now, if you look at the fibers, you know, the abdominal muscle fibers have got two roles. One is stabilization and another is movement. When we say stabilization, that the body has to be stable and we have to see what muscles make the body stable. And then we have to see when the body is moving, how these muscles coordinate with other limb muscles and back muscles to, to do this coordination. So which are the muscles which stabilize the uh, uh, human body. They are type 1 muscles. They are having the slow twitching of these muscles. They are slowly, they are not moving fast. They are just slowly twitching. You know, that twitching has the power of having a sustained contraction. If the muscle is moving fast, they cannot sustain the contraction. So there are type 1 muscles and then you talk about the transversus abdominis ta you will mention here has the greatest proportion of this type of fiber i think i would like to repeat my uh, uh, sort of you know sentence what i have said transversus abdominal muscle has the greatest number of slow twitching muscles that means that transverse abdominis is the greatest stabilization responsibility of the body. Second, of course, is the rectus abdominis because it is a vertical muscle and this has got the least slow twitching fibers. It just moves quickly. So it's a totally different. Rectus abdominis is a quick sort of movement, up and down, bending, and Transverses has got the highest number of those. Then we talk about movement. And movement is done by the type 2 muscles. Type 2 muscles has got a fast twitching. The, you know, they function anaerobically, you know, so that they can, you know, quickly move. And of course, we have got uh, uh, external oblique, internal oblique, and rectus abdominis. So these are the fast twitching movements which produce a movement, running, jogging, walking, you know, twisting, turning. So these are the three muscles which are responsible. And this is, I think, is a very, very important slide for our colleagues to understand who are talking about that. Now, if you look at the function, the muscles are divided into prime movers, as we just discussed, and stabilizers. And the prime movers of the body are rectus abdominis, internal oblique, and external oblique. 
एंड स्टेबलाइजर इज ट्रांसफर सो प्लीज अंडरस्टैंड द इम्पोर्टेंस नाउ यू सी द मूवर्स ऑफकोर्स यू नो एक्सटर्नल एंड इनर इंटरनल ऑब्लिक एंड डेक्टस मसल्स आर द मूवर्स विच मूव द बॉडी इन द फ्रंट और इन द बैक but the stabilizer is more important muscle and that is the transverse abdominis functionally this is one of the most important muscle and you know the stabilizer because it is a stabilizer it it also originates from each and every body you know like the pelvis the chest the spine the anterior uh, um, uh, abdominal structures so transverse abdominis is one muscle which connects with the diaphragm also the uh, 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 abdominal diaphragm the pelvic diaphragm with the all spine spine etc and that's why i would like that i would talk more about the transverses uh, first let us see rectus of course is a long paired muscle we know the origin the function is it stabilizes but it's a prime mover and we talk when we talk about the transverses we know that it it gets uh, origin from the inguinal ligament the costal cartilage the 7 to 10 iliac crest thoracolumbar fascia and as its joint uh, at the conjoint tendon as well as uh, uh, other uh, fibrous structures and the function is not only the stabilization but it has got a very important role in respiration and it is very important respiratory muscle now what when the transverse contracts what happens it braces the abdominal cavity lumbar spine pelvis all together as one piece of the body and it forms a semi rigid cylinder for the prime mover it, it it provides the cylinder on which that cylinder the prime movers like external oblique internal oblique rectus will work so it stabilizes while the body other three muscles are moving the body it stabilizes the body in one position when we talk about the altered movements then we talk about if you have a poor transverses then you will have backache there will be negative feedback for the respiration and of course there will be repetitive micro trauma to the spine which can take place once this muscle is not working but the most important part of transverse is is breathing because it connects both the diaphragm abdominal diaphragm the pelvic diaphragm and it moves up and down like a piston and this is one of the very important respiratory muscles especially it's very important when the person is breathing fast or when there is a pulmonary edema or when there is any respiratory distress bronchial asthma etc so this or bronchospasm for that matter this muscle has to be intact to overcome that crisis and of course it plays important role while you are exercising by increasing the respiratory function and giving more volume to the lung and if you really look uh, to uh, the uh, important uh, part of aircraft is a vertical stabilizer rudders aileron so these are the abdominal muscles which we just spoke they are the tail of the aircraft which is responsible for stabilization and also for the direction so now the new methods have come we talk about etp milos intraperitoneal approach and all sort of names which i'm sure you are more familiar but i would just give very simple example what is the difference like in tp if you see your dissection is in the lower part of the abdomen which is uh, painted there you are not entering the whole abdomen so you are just working in the lower portion but when you do etp you involve the very big portion of uh, the abdominal wall so i feel that possibly in many cases it is too much to uh, sort of dissect which may or may not be necessary but as i said that when you dissect too much the chances of the having more and more problems then you disturb the linea alba you many anatomical structures 
are disturbed by going into that. Same thing is with the tar. Uh, when you are closing the midline, you are dividing posteriorly. And this is what, what we see. Now, this is a CT scan uh, given by one of our colleagues where a tar was done. And the whole intestine through the tar incision went into the, uh, into the this thing. And this, work causes, uh, this caused a very serious internal herniation because of the continuity is gone. And also the wound which looks on the day of operation uh, when we do all these extensive procedures. But many of this time, these sort of patients, which uh, of course are referred to tertiary care centers, the mesh needs to be exposed. Then we have to put back dressing, etc. You can see these sort of wounds, which we off and on have to come across and handle because it's a tertiary care center. So I think, you know, we get these sort of things and then you start closing them. Uh, and uh, all these are all, I think, the various types of this thing. So I think I'm coming to uh, end of my presentation. Uh, we, when we are doing the surgery for hernia, we need to understand that it is a, is a repair job which you are doing, not doing for something fatal. Hernia is not likely to kill anybody. So please make sure that the surgery should not also kill these patients. So you should look at the risk which you are taking and what reward you are getting uh, by repairing the hernia. And moving from a single surgeon, I very strongly feel now that now the herniologist and the hernia centers should move to the multidisciplinary approach where you have the surgeon, you have the trained anesthetist because of the abdominal issues as abdominal muscle involvement should have a good physiotherapist and nutritionist, the cardiologist and the pulmonologist to handle the situation. So it is a, it's a teamwork, not those days, I think uh, many decades back, it was a surgeon who was responsible. But unless you have a multimodality a treatment and well-trained experts, you should not get into this. So I bring the greetings from our hospital now. It is one of the very uh, interesting uh, center in the world. Uh, for liver and gastrointestinal sciences, which is from A to Z, including the experience of 6,500 uh, liver transplant and about 85,000 minimal access metabolic and variatic surgeries. So I think it's a, and, and also international um, third space uh, uh, intervention, uh, gastroenterology and therapeutic uh, endoscopy. So this is a, one of the very strong force now. And that brings to end of my presentation. Uh, I would love to have your interaction and also would move on to uh, uh, stop sharing my slides. Thank you so much, sir. That was such a wonderful presentation, full of wisdom as usual. And uh, always we find your thoughts very, you know, invigorating, very thought provoking. And uh, it is true that we have always found a lot of wisdom in it. Uh, sir, uh, I would like to kickstart the discussion by, by, by saying that, you know, the minimally invasive hernia surgery, despite its almost two and a half decades of presence, has not gained the kind of popularity that laparoscopic gallbladder surgery has gained. So I just wanted to know that, you know, in your long, uh, because you have been training so many surgeons, what do you find are the challenges why minimal access hernia surgery is still not as commonly practiced as, uh, as gallbladder surgery? Uh, Sumit, I think, uh, thank you very much. I, I would like to divide my answer into two. One is the surgical issue. The surgical issue is that, you know, like when we started, see, when we were learning, we were learning, I, I at the whole thing I'm talking about the inguinal um, uh, hernia, because we understood the anatomy from outside. So you make an incision on in the skin, subcutaneous tissue, then external oblique, and then the inguinal canal and the conjoint tendon, and then you down them, you put in a mesh there. So that is what the anatomy you uh, were taught. You take the gallbladder anatomy. 
the gallbladder anatomy, which were taught to you, cystic duct, cystic artery, everything remains the same. So gallbladder became very, very popular, right? But when you started doing inguinal hernia surgery, you were talking of the Cooper's ligament, you're talking about the pectinate line, you were talking about the iliopubic um, tract. You were not talking about external oblique, you're not talking about internal oblique, you're not talking about the uh, ilioinguinal nerves, you're not talking about uh, so many things. So I think, according to me, the biggest problem was endoscopic anatomy of a groin hernia, which took time for the surgeons to understand and also to uh, develop that dexterity to manipulate in that closed uh, sort of uh, uh, field. So I think that is one. Second is non-academic, maybe I would say commercial, is it? If I say, so what happens, the insurance companies were also smart, and I'm talking of the Western world. Insurance companies were also smart. They said that we will give you for inguinal hernia X amount of uh, money. So what has happened, most of the inguinal hernia surgery in the Western world was done in the day clinic by the surgeon themselves. So because they were doing under local anesthesia, it, the requirement was different. You don't have to have a lot of uh, gadgets there. The Whether you do laparoscopically or by conventional method, the charges paid by the insurance company for inguinal hernia was the same. So surgeon said, what is the point in losing that uh, sort of money? And so that was another aspect. This is what I feel. Second, I think the few surgeons were doing uh, for this because they were thinking about the equipment, but I feel that once you have bought the equipment for the gallbladder surgery or appendix or for uh, uh, hysterectomies, the same instrument and equipment can be used for hernia surgery also. And uh, you don't really need big disposables, uh, which is uh, uh, required. So this is what I feel has been, and very few training centers were available. Now I think we have got abundant training centers all across uh, the country. Uh, thank you, sir. Coming to training, I mean, you have been a teacher all your life and training uh, so many people. And we have seen that there is a learning curve to every, uh, you know, there is a technical uh, learning curve to every new procedure. And like you said, for almost two decades, the hernia surgery and the minimal access herniologists were training themselves in minimal access hernia surgery and the intraperitoneal mesh placement and defect closure surgery. But we saw that despite two decades of the presence of this surgery, for various reasons, as you enunciated, the penetration is not that much there. And now suddenly we find somehow there is a burst of procedures which you mentioned in your presentation like ETEP procedure, MILOS, TARM and so many other extraperitoneal hernia placement procedure requiring even more level of dexterity and requiring which have even more potential of, uh, uh, you know, causing damage if the surgeon is not very skillfully trained. So even while we can justify that, you know, we have our learning curve, you know, any damages that we do during our learning curve eventually means a bad result for a patient. So we have to be very careful and so what would you say, you know, how the training of this, uh, now that herniology is a speciality, how should the training of the surgeons uh, be there so that they are able to cause the least amount of damage to their patients? Well, I think I, I would suggest that any surgeon who wants to become herniologist should be trained on A to Z. Every Because hernia is a very common general surgical procedure. So I would say that some of us, we should know that you are a general surgeon and you will do whatever is possible for you to do within your, as I said, if you don't have a multidisciplinary approach, it is better to continue doing under local anesthesia or whatever it is, simple inguinal hernias, umbilical hernias, whatever. I think within means, you should assess your muscle power. You should assess how is your system geared up for that. And then only you should take. The complex hernias, big hernias, loss of domain, this, that, I think, should be restricted to very few, very enthusiastic herniologists and also which needs uh, mental preparation for the patients 
their expenses, how much expenses are going to be there, and also those complications which are going to be there, and should be very uh, aptly they should be supported by the team of anesthetists and also the modern gadgets. Many of these surgeries which I am talking about, complex surgeries, uh, still many of them are done by conventional method. And that is, I think, is quite surprising because of the uh, sort of social media training uh, which is there, uh, virtual training which is taking place. People are getting more and more attracted towards it. But having said that, I uh, keep my uh, comments very reserved because being a tertiary hernia center for us, we do go beyond our uh, uh, this thing, but still we try to keep ourselves within our means because we very strongly feel and very confidently tell that hernia is a reparative surgery for a benign condition which is least likely to kill that person. It is not like a cancer. So wherever you are operating, I would rather prefer to repair a hernia rather than reconstruct a hernia. Right, sir. Well said, sir. One last question now that I have you here. So I will take the liberty of asking one last question before we move on to for the next session. And that is regarding the application of the robot. Because uh, having known you, I know you were involved very early with the intuitive surgicals and uh, Da Vinci system and you have the system at your disposal for many years now. And so with the newer uh, robots, like robotic platforms likely to come, there is expanding indication for uh, doing robotic surgery. So please uh, guide us, you know, what is your views about the robotic hernia operations? Well, I think robotic hernia will greatly help in closing the defect, you know, which uh, 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 for uh, uh, most of the uh, surgeons, you may find it challenging, time consuming. So I think when you're closing the defect, probably robot will be doing a, a good job, a quick job, and uh, average skilled surgeon will also be able to use that robot. And I think robot will be purchased, acquired for the pelvic surgery, for the urological surgeries, the you know uterine surgeries, the malignancies, and oral surgeries for that matter. So I think once you have a robot, possibly it will help us uh, uh, tremendously in closing and suturing the abdominal wall uh, rather than any other step of the uh, surgery. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that wonderful talk and answering all our queries. Uh, I will now invite Dr. Sunil Popat, President of uh, IAGES. Uh, welcome, Dr. Sunil. Thank you, Dr. Sumit. Good evening, friends and colleagues. Thank you, Professor Chaube, sir, for a wonderful lecture and keynote address. Friends, IAGES prime time has become a very popular program all across the world. And the timing has been brought a little earlier to 8.30 p.m. on the request of many of our listeners. Today, we are, we are having two giants in their respective fields, Professor Chobe and Dr. G. V. Rao. Professor Chobe is teacher to almost all the laparoscopic surgeons of India in our age group. He can be easily said the father figure in laparoscopic hernia surgery in India. Not only he has uh, developed this speciality, but he has guided all the aspiring laparoscopic surgeons and promoted them to do more and more laparoscopic hernia surgery. In spite of doing thousands of surgeries, sir, you, you have always given the correct message. Today also you have said, bigger the hernia, bigger the expectation. I also remember once you told us in Pulse Hernia program, which we did in Ahmedabad, that it is not the responsibility of the surgeon that the hernia has become very big. And I still remember, just to clarify your thoughts on that, that two big hernias 
don't take too many challenges if the patient is asymptomatic leave it as it is sir i would like to hear your thoughts again on that and let other people also know about that well i think i know if i summarize i think uh, sometimes uh, the surgeon uh, falsely start believing that they are god and uh, it becomes your ego issue that whatever size of hernia i am going to repair this hernia and not uh, accept that how can a hernia be not repaired by me as a surgeon this is a big uh, 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 ego issue so i would like to be very modest and i would say that if the patient has not bothered for that hernia which was uh, a walnut size hernia to letting it grow and come right up to the knee uh, and then he comes to you why should you feel challenged you said okay you have lived with it what is there if there is a loss of domain the guy has accepted the loss of domain and working with the loss of domain and why you want to push it back all the intestines back and you see see sunil I'll, let me give you another example i know uh, we are taking time but tell me when a patient of cancer the malignant condition comes what the oncologists do he grades he says okay stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 stage 4 whether i am going to do a curative a surgery with a curative intention or we are doing surgery with a palliative intention so when you come across any hernia you should assess the stage of the hernia if it is a stage 4 hernia with loss of domain there is that all why you have to you should treat him as a stage 4 malignancy absolutely you cannot be too extensive too aggressive that remove this remove that cut this joint that put this put that because god has made only one part of the body flexible and that is the abdominal wall muscle which is used for pulmonary edema for myocardial infarction for pregnancy for ascites for everything the abdominal muscle this is a uh, you know space given and then when we freeze out that space with the putting 30 by 30 meshes in two diamonds then the god is not uh, 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 stupid to give you that flexible uh, abdominal wall right while you are walking while you are uh, climbing the stairs you need abdominal musculature and you made that mus- musculature into a rigid wall what will happen between two layers of muscle you put a, a proline mesh or any mesh for that matter and the fibrosis will take place and that will become a scar plate which is rigid so this is my 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 submission is now we talk lot about the intra uh, peritoneal placement of mesh but why should we not talk about the what happens to a mesh when it is put between the two skeletal muscles one skeletal muscle here one skeletal muscle here so now this muscle will also be fibrous this muscle will also be fibrous and that mesh will also be fibrous and the mesh will contract yeah so the god has given us a flexible abdominal wall while you are running your abdominal wall is coming up and down when there is a patient who develops anaphylaxis abdominal muscle when there is a pulmonary edema abdominal muscle when there is a pregnancy there is abdominal muscle so we i according to me we have no right to take away uh, that sort of you know gift given by god when you talk of ipom you may have reservation but we have thousands of thousands of cases uh, of ipom done in the past in ipom you are putting a peritoneum on the peritoneum so peritoneum is involved below is the omentum so omentum is again mobile structure and peritoneum is also you are not taking away the elasticity of the abdominal wall right so this is my simple suggestion yeah thank you so much sir for your thoughts and your sharing your experience and expertise we are really blessed today another speaker is dr jv rao everybody knows jv all across the country as well as across the world he is the surgeon endoscopist and he has been into the field of surgery and gi endoscopy for last 40 years with increasing amount of uh, gi endoscopy procedures being uh, more and more therapeutic and interventional the role of surgeon has really increased 
today he has chosen a topic which is also very important very interesting also that he has chosen an intraoperative endoscopy and uh, i am sure he is the best person to talk about it because he is the surgeon doing gi endoscopy doing gi surgery and doing lot of innovations himself so gv we are very thankful to you for agreeing to giving a lecture today and we welcome you to the igs platform i also welcome our president elect dr thanga velu who has joined us from coimbatore and after the gv's lecture uh, dr thanga velu welcome everybody to coimbatore conference also i will request dr desarkar to formally introduce gv and proceed with the second session first i must profusely thank my old trusted friend mr president that i should be proper to give me the honor to introduce my model surgeon dr gv rao dr gududu venkat rao gv rao is the director of prestigious asian institute of radiology <coughs> hyderabad india the institute is a tertiary referral center certified as a center of excellence by the world endoscopy organization and is consecutively rated as one of the best in the field of gastroenterology by several surveys conducted by various agencies for the clinical care academics and research in the field of gastroenterology the institute is expanding its facility to 1000 beds and would be one of the largest single specialty gastroenterology centers in the world with an unparalleled infrastructure and cutting edge technology to cater all sections of the society asian institute of gastroenterology is part of apan the asia pacific advanced network that is a non profit organization and that's the legal entity created to undertake activities dr gv rao is the chief of surgical gastroenterology minimally invasive surgery and transplantation and services and is in charge of the surgical gastroenterology training program dnb phd and fellowship program and has trained over 100 surgeons in gastroenterology The DNB Surgical Gastroenterology Program at the AIG is rated as the best training unit by the National Board. AIG has been consistently the first choice for the top rankers in the national selection process. Thirty fellows have been successfully trained and are amongst the best GI surgeons practicing both in India and across the world. DNB National Board has instituted a gold medal in DNB Surgical Gastroenterology since last six years. and four of these were awarded to the students from the AIG DNB surgical gastroenterology program he has organized several national international conferences and workshop as part of academics and is a faculty member of several national and international conferences he is currently the president of indian chapter of international hepato gastroenterology biliary association he is the board member of asia pacific endoscopy task force Asia Pacific Endo Laparoscopic Surgeons and is the executive board of committees of Indian Association of Surgical Gastroenterology Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy of India past president Indian Association of Gastroenterology and Association of Minimally Invasive Surgeons of India he has delivered several prestigious named orations both nationally and internationally and he is the recipient of the BCDI national award for the year 2019 for his contribution in the development of specialty and is the recipient of government of india parliament gold medal for his outstanding contribution to the field of gastroenterology he was recently awarded the economic times inspiring doctors of india award which acknowledges the architects of healthy india in view of his contribution he was awarded the honorary fellowship of the venezuelan surgical society philippine surgical society egyptian laparoscopic surgical society and the fellowship of the royal college surgeons of glasgow dr rai is one of the few surgeons in the world with enormous experience of both minimally invasive endoscopy and laparoscopic surgery has pioneered several innovative hybrid techniques including laparoscopy assisted pan intraoperative intraoperative cystoscopy is one of the pioneers in the emerging technology of the notes that is natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery 
also known as the nose scar surgeon. He is credited and acknowledged for the first transoral endoscopic appendectomy in humans in the world. As part of the NOTES campaign, he has conducted several live workshops and is involved in the technology development of NOTES. This is considered the next big revolution in minimally invasive surgery, which would increase decrease the morbidity of the surgeon. He is actively involved in designing and development of several accessories and stains which are economical and are in clinical usage. AIG has successfully developed very economical robotic nurse in collaboration with IIT Hyderabad and economic endoscopic simulator in collaboration with Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He is the editorial board of several peer-reviewed journals and has more than 150 publications in national and international journals and authored several chapters of textbooks of surgery and endoscopy. Dr. Rao is associated with Asian Healthcare Foundation, which is dedicated to the healthcare needs of the rural population of India. Dr. Rao is associated with Asian Institute of Basic Sciences under Asian Healthcare Foundation, which is actively involved in basic research and translation and medicine. The institute has full-time scientists and offering recognized PhD courses. The basic science tech facility has several breakthroughs in the field of hepatology, inflammatory bowel disease, and pancreatology, etc. He is part of the team responsible for identification of mutations in pancreatic disease and is acknowledged worldwide. Islet transplantation is one of the emerging modalities for treatment of diabetes. He was involved in the Government of India through DBT ICMR research experimental work, which is successfully completed and is now approved for clinical implementation in India. AI is credited as the first and the only center in India to start successful autologous islet cell transplantation. With all these points, I must also say Dr. Jivira is the person ever smiling and really most inspiring for all of us of my generation and next to all my generation. Please, Dr. Rao. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jasarkar. Actually, I am humbled by your introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really humbled by the introduction. Uh, and it is very, very difficult to follow a legend. Actually, I'll call Pradeep a legend. I don't think I'm nowhere near Pradeep. It's very, very difficult to follow Pradeep. And that has been an outstanding lecture of the wisdom that has accumulated over 30 years or 40, 30, 35 years. Phenomenal talk. I think every younger surgeon should listen to this before they venture into what to do, what not to do. You are absolutely a fabulous, fabulous lecture, uh, Pradeep, actually. I mean, I don't think I can have words for that. Uh, I would like to invite you uh, one of our uh, grand rounds actually for de delivering only this lecture. I don't want any anything else. Because Thank I want people you. to know what they have to practice, what they should not practice. I will this, be honored, GV. Thank you. No, no. This is a phenomenal lecture actually, Pradeep. Actually, I don't think, see, here's a wisdom bit put in to uh, uh, tell the juniors what to do and what not. Thank you so much. I think I should not waste much of uh, the time. Uh, Now, in the outset, actually, I, I think it is uh, my uh, the thing to thank the entire organization, the entire executive committee of IAGS for giving me this honor of talking during this IAGS prime time. I know it's been, the slot has been uh, taken by a lot of seniors from the minimally invasive surgery. I'm absolutely dumbfounded that uh, Sunil Poppet has decided that I should be doing a talk in this prime time and sharing my screen time with uh, none other than uh, Dr. Pradeep Chaudhary. Thank you so much, Sunil, for this. And I entire thank the entire executive for this honor that is bestowed on me. Now, I was thought, uh, took this topic basically because uh, uh, we all understand about two decades back when endoscopy came in, the surgeons, because of lack of time, and they thought it will not venture into, uh, into great clinical practice. They did not take much interest in endoscopy. And over the years, endoscopy has matured into a very huge specialty and it is making inroads into uh, uh, clinical uh, services in such a way that some of the procedures that were done by the surgical paternity were slowly being taken over by the endoscopist. So over the period of time, it is also 
known that some of the surgeons have also ventured into endoscopy and taken endoscopy as a specialty. It should have been done. I think this uh, endoscopy should have been with us. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it has been taken over, and maybe we didn't, surgeons didn't have much time to spare on that. But there is another aspect of this, an intraoperative endoscopy, which has been speciality, which is becoming a separate speciality by itself. And if you see any of the national, national international meetings that are happening, a separate session is dedicated to intraoperative endoscopy. This is becoming a separate speciality. And I suggest that all the younger surgeons who are practicing should at least know the basic upper GI endoscopy and colonoscopy to make sure that the procedure that I'm going to show you can be very safely performed. So, intraoperative endoscopy is an evolving technique that has received limited attention in the literature. It is effectively used as an aid to the surgeon to locate pathology, not otherwise detectable, and to alter or to enhance diagnosis and therapy at surgery, be it be open or laparoscopic surgery. Limitations of haptics in minimally invasive surgery, new technologies, and surgeon's passion have led to increasing indications of intraoperative endoscopy, and it has the potential to be as much service to the surgeon as a scalpel or a ripper. I'll show you how. Now, intraoperative endoscopy traditionally has been used uh, for assessing the true gastroesophageal junction, anastomotic leaks, luminal patency, for control of any postoperative bleeds, trans elimination, trying to help some difficult dissections, and localization of difficult some tumors and polyps. This is what the initial intraoperative endoscopy was restricted to. But over the period of time, you know that both endoscopy and laparoscopy have evolved as big specialties, and each of these specialties have both pros and cons. The endoscopy has the pros of flexibility, maneuverability, uh, where the difficulties are orientation and accessories and the limitation of uh, available energy sources. On the laparoscopic side, we have the rigid scope, the dissection, dissection, anastomosis, hemostasis is feasible. We have ICG and IR right now. Whereas organ preserving surgery seems to be a limitation when you're doing laparoscopy surgery. So, when you combine this, both endoscopy and laparoscopy, the pros and cons of both of these things, and we start practicing a different specialty, it's called as endolaparoscopic cooperative surgery. Now, the theater basically looks something different. We have two consoles, uh, basically, one for the endoscopy and one for the laparoscopy. It looks slightly more clustered as compared to just laparoscopic OR, but I'll show you how this entire concept is going to improve the overall outcomes in some surgical uh, pathologies. Now we have intraoperative endoscopy, it restricted to esophagus and stomach. We talked about intraoperative endoscopy, intraoperative colonoscopy, intraoperative pancreatoscopy, and intraoperative So all these are the evolving specialties in intraoperative endoscopy. I'll give you a couple of examples. This is the data that was published some time back wherein they talked about the role of intraoperative endoscopy in laparoscopic fundoplication. Now, when we do intraoperative endoscopy, the re-intervention rates are less as compared to patients in whom we do not do intraoperative endoscopy. This is a very good data to show that whenever we are doing laparoscopic fundoplication, it is, I'm, I'm not saying it is mandatory, but it is better if you have facility for intraoperative endoscopy to do intraoperative endoscopy. Likewise, uh, for endless myotomy, there has been a lot of debate to, to whether to do intraoperative endoscopy or not. Uh, there are people who swear by doing intraoperative endoscopy to check for any mucosal breaches or to check for the extent of the uh, myotomy that you have done. But there is data to show that if you have facility, you can do it, but it is not mandatory that you do this intraoperative endoscopy. We routinely do intraoperative endoscopy at our center to make sure that there's no mucosal breach. Here, instead of insufflating with the rice tube, we insufflate to check for any leak. Here, we insufflate with the endoscope to check for the leaks and to check for any. And now, the advent of ICG, I'll show you, we're checking for the mucosal, uh, the vascularity of the mucosa at the end of the procedure. Likewise, for, uh, for all bariatric procedure, now we have either use a bougie or a scope whenever we do a sleeve gastrectomy like this. Now, intraoperative guidance using an endoscope is at least as safe and effective as a bougie. And if you have facility for an endoscope, you can always do an endoscopy. And if you have any leaks that are detected on table, it is likely that you can correct these things on table. So, intraoperative endoscopy for sleeve resection is a good modality. And even when you're doing a proven by bypass, to check for the anastomosis and also check the 
size of the anastomosis and also when it bleeds, leaks, it can be used as an intraoperative guidance. And you can see this, this is a beautiful data that shows that if you do an intraoperative anastomotic testing, this may avoid early gas complications. So it's a safe, reliable method to assess the anastomotic integrity and correct the difference under direct vision to avoid any early complications of this anastomosis. Give you a couple of examples. Actually, this is a large esophageal diverticulum. Now uh, you can see this. This traditionally would have, uh, we all agree that uh, now thoracoscopy is the gold standard for this. Now I'll not skip the video for this. The only thing that I wanted to show you was after we do this staple, because we, the scope is in the lumen of the uh, esophagus, we staple this. Now we are avoiding a incision, we are stapling the thing. At the same time, we are checking for the integrity of the lumen, any leaks, any bleeds on the endoscope itself. You can see this the endoscope passes through this. You can see the transient elimination of the endoscope. I can see the beautifully vascularized esophagus, and you're sure that there are no leaks. The leakage testing can also be done. So, all the esophageal pathologists now it would be better that you have this facility for intraoperative endoscopy. It would be very, very useful. Intraoperative endoscopy uh, we have capsule endoscopy and uh, spiral endoscopy as in today in clinical practice. But it does not mean that we are avoiding intraoperative endoscopy. Still, there is a small role for intraoperative endoscopy in spite of the advances in small wall endoscopy in the form of capsule endoscopy and spiral endoscopy. Uh, this is, and if we modified this, this was, the, this was the thing that I presented way back in 1996, showing that laparoscopic aspect pan endoscopy can be an alternative to uh, uh, intraoperative uh, open uh, laparotomy. Here we make an Enterotomy somewhere in the mid uh, distal jejunum, and we go both proximally and distally. And we have had a lot of examples where we could spare some polyps, coagulate some avians, and this was the data that we published way back in 2001. Now, intraoperative pancatechoscopy is becoming uh, making its inroads into guidelines of management of IPMN. Here, one such lesion, a ripples, was done. And after we resected the thing, actually, I put in a scope to check for any skip lesion. This lesion was picked up almost about 1.5 centimeters from the resected margin, which was not picked up on conventional cross-sectional imaging. Had we done an anastomosis here, this patient would have come back with a recurrence very soon. So you can see this intraoperative endoscopy, pancreatoscopy seems to alter uh, the way we, we do surgery, and we have to resect this, revise the margins, and then substitute subsequently to the pancreatoscopy. This is the same example of a pa pa same patient doing the specimen side. We also check again, you can show, I'll show you here that the resection margin is clear. And this is the beautiful front that the endoscopist keeps showing us about the typical IPM. So, so intraoperative pancreas spectroscopy is becoming a uh, new modality and it is making inroads into algorithms of management of IPM. And I'm sure in the days to come, we'll, uh, with more uh, slimmer scopes, digital scope that we have, the vision will be better and we'll be able to do these procedures better. Intraoperative VRCP is an alternative to either preoperative or a postoperative VRCP. If you have facilities to do an intraoperative VRCP, it is shown that it has got equal results as compared to preoperative or postoperative VRCP. Now, common bile duct stone is one uh, such thing which can uh, most of the things are hand being handled by the endoscopist right now. But on this until we have some expertise to the endoscopy, it is very, very difficult to manipulate these scopes during laparoscopic colidoposcopy whenever you try to do this. Now, we have lost this completely to the endoscopist, unfortunately, but some of the centers do, do uh, continue to practice this. We continue to practice this, especially in some large uh, CPD stones. So some amount of knowledge of flexible endoscopy is mandatory to know how to maneuver and how to use the accessories during this process, guide wires, balloons, baskets. So these are things mandatory that you have some knowledge of this endoscopy during this entire process so that uh, you, you should be able to do some of these procedures. That is the upper end of the sphincter. You'll never see this endoscopically. You'll be seeing the other side. This is the sphincter. But the biggest advantage when we do this, we don't cut the sphincter and the patient is uh, saved of the post-operative reflex that happens into these patients. Now, this is one such patient with the colorocal switch with the large IPMN that was detected actually. Now, you can see this is a large IPMN. Now we dissected out the entire lichen that the lower end of the polydocal cyst. Now here, ligated transected this, and then we subsequently I did a cholangioscopy on table. I can see this is a, these are the first ever images of 
intraoperative colonoscopy anywhere in the world. You can see beautifully transeliminated uh, entire uh, polydopal cyst. And you can see this. This is how it looks like. Now, I'll tell you why we did this. I wanted to check for the resection margin here. Now, I can see here very safely that the hilum is clear. Both the, all the ducts are clear. And I have adequate margin to resect below, below the hilum. And same thing, I, we check this actually. When I check this again, I went approximately into the intrahepatic ducts, find an additional stone in, in addition to the IPMN, which I was able to extract using the Dormia basket. The biggest advantage of this is that I was able to delineate margin. You can see that was the stone that was there, picked up, and then we extracted that. The biggest advantage of this was actually we were able to check the resection margin. The resection margin is free. We check this for sent it to frozen section, subsequently to did intraoperative polangioscopy again to make sure that everything is clear. And then we did an anastomosis. This is the specimen for this. Now, ICG and infrared laparoscopy are uh, the new entrant into laparoscopy right now. And we have uh, more and more of these uh, uh, coming into clinical practice right now. And uh, we have a lot of uh, every equipment has and today seems to have some sort of uh, infrared technology. And ICG has become part and parcel of laparoscopy surgery. Here we use indigo cyanine green as to inject, and subsequently we do visualize this under infrared light to see for pathology which is not seen in conventional white light. I'll give you a couple of examples of intra. I'm not talking about lapro ICG and laparoscopy. I'm talking about intraoperative endoscopy here. One such gastric lesion here. Now I'm injecting the ICG into the around the lesion here, and you can see it beautifully eliminates here. This idea is to pick up the nodes. Here, the sent maybe the sentinel load, or maybe if you're doing a D2 gastrectomy, this we certainly sometimes we pick up nodes beyond the D2 gastrectomy, and it helps us to pick up these lesions which are there beyond the D2 gastrectomy. Likewise, this is on such patient with the colonic CA, the sigmoid growth. Actually, here we injected this and we are able to now we obviously know that okay, we are doing it this thing, but we obviously try to see if there is any import involved beyond the radical resection that we perform. So this is intra, either we gave it preoperatively or intralesional injection of indigo cyanin is also an accepted modality to check for the lymph node involvement and the extent of resection. With ICG becoming part and parcel of all laparoscopic instrumentation that is coming into clinical practice, I think the younger surgeon should know about all these uh, modalities to make sure that they can utilize this technology aptly. Likewise, you can see this endo there are certain polyps that we encounter in clinical practice. Endoscopic removal of benign polyps is not always possible, such so some large polyps like this. Now, in these patients, we invariably tend to do a segmental colectomy. But with the advances in lap endolaparoscopic surgery, now we can do a sleeve resection of this under endoscopic guidance to make sure that you are avoiding a major surgical procedure. And there's a beautiful data that shows that it is less cost effective. And the patient stays in the hospital for a shorter period of time. Now, this is another patient that's a huge uh, fibrolamellar uh, lesion that was projecting into the esophagus from the from the cricopharynx. Actually, you can see this is a huge polyp that was projecting right from the cricopharynx to the thing. So we had to go do uh, open the neck. Actually, went in actually pharynx. Actually, then we pulled out this entire. Uh, uh, prolapsing polyp, and then subsequently we could do this, and we did this endoscopic guidance, and then resected this. The best part of this is actually what I enjoyed uh, doing this was we resected this, but the subsequent part of the closure of the neck, the pharynx, was done in an endoscopic position. I don't think anybody would have seen videos like this where you're doing the pharyngeal opening being sutured and endoscopic vision. At the end of the day, we're making sure that the, the, the defect is properly closed hemostatically. And then I can see this. This is how uh, it is done. And then we check the integrity of the whole thing. Actually, made sure that the whole thing is polyp is removed. And then at the end of the procedure, you can see this is how it looks from inside. Now there are a lot of other things that have come into clinical practice because of increasing use of uh, cross-sectional imaging. A lot of subepithelial tumors are being increasingly detected. We seem to understand the biological behavior of these tumors better now. 
And we also understand that the segmental and minimally invasive uh, techniques are better as compared to radical resections based on sound oncological principles. And these seem to have better functional outcomes than faster recovery. Now, there are various uh, procedures that are described from, on this endolaparoscopic cooperative surgery. Depending on how much of endoscopic element and how much of laparoscopic element is involved in the surgical procedure, and how much the endoscopist and the laparoscopic surgeon contributes. These are all the procedures that are made for organ preserving surgery. And we have different types of procedures that are designed to the um, to lesions which have different levels of penetration or different levels of involvement of the gastric wall or the colonic wall. Now, I'll show you a couple of examples, actually. This is the standard uh, uh, sleeve resection that we do. We all understand that, actually, you may ask me that, actually, you will not require an endoscopic assistance to this. Uh, you can see this is a sleeve resection that you're doing. But the best part of it is, <coughs> you can see this. As you're firing the stapler, you can see this endoscopically. We are also always bothered about the bleeding that occurs on the laparoscopic side, but we never bothered about what happens on the endoscopic side. This is the uh, firing line, this is the staple line, as it is seen on the endoscopic side. <coughs> now, the biggest disadvantage of sleeve resection is the amount of resection that is done in conventional sleeve resection is slightly more especially if you're taking on both the directions, actually on one side, you're taking a bigger margin, on the other side, you're taking a smaller margin. Now, this is another example of a gist at the GE junction. You can see this, we put in a PET catheter, and then under endoscopic vision, <coughs> actually I'm excising this using a harmonic scalpel, and you can see this, but for this, this would uh, require some sort of a gastrotomy or a proximal gastrectomy. Now, this is another patient with the SCT uh, at the GE junction. You can see this. I'm doing a laparoscopic resection in this, trying to identify this lesion first, then did a gastrotomy, then went in, excised this uh, subepithelial lesion, completely subepithelial lesion, made an incision on the mucosa, excised this entire thing. But what happened at that end, end of the procedure was, even after we closed the thing, there was a small area of defect, which was not sutured. So under endoscopy guidance, we are able to put these clips, make sure that this patient did not have any post-operative bleed. Now, this is another patient with full thickness resection. You can see this, this again. Uh, you can see this, you can, uh, this is a large subepithelial tumor. And then you do a standard surgical procedure for this. Uh, the biggest advantage of this is actually at the end of the procedure, you close this entire defect actually, you Put this, this is what we do routinely, and then you suture this actually, and at the end of the procedure, you are able to make sure that uh, the entire defect is closed. This is what we do routinely, but here again, I'll show you an example of where endoscopists and laparoscopic surgeons came together to do a procedure that is something different from what it is done. Here it is just to get people adapted to these procedures. You can understand actually both the endoscopists and laparoscopic surgeons to see what can be done and what is the future. Now, here we identified the lesion. We do a traditional uh, resection here uh, of the entire procedure, like what we do in conventional laparoscopic surgery under endoscopic guidance. Now, here, these are the procedures wherein the endoscopist and the laparoscopic surgeon should work together to understand how they can match the speed and also what each person can contribute. Here, again, at the end of the procedure, what we have done was, it is not that mandatory. This can be easily removed laparoscopically, but we to train the endoscopist, we made sure that this was held with an endoscope and moved into the endobag. This is a very, very difficult maneuver. It looks very, very simple, but for a flexible endoscope to do this maneuver, it's very difficult. This is basically to train people to do this procedure. Again, this is another example of a duodenal lesion wherein the full thickness resection was done in endoscopic guidance. Uh, you can see we have an endoscope here, and then we mark out the lesion from the endoscopy side, and then we do a full thickness resection, and then we close the thing laparoscopically. So this lesion was not picked up on laparoscopy because the small light was predominantly mucosal lesion. So it was picked up, marked out endoscopically, and then subsequently excised uh, laparoscopically, and we did complete closure. Now, this is another lesion, uh, early gastric cancer. 
Now you can see these are <coughs> the things that are being increasingly practiced if you pick up. Now the lesion is injected submucosally. We inject endoscopically. We inject the entire lesion submucosally, keeping in view all the oncological principles. And we make a seromuscular incision well away from the lesion. You can see this. We have, and the methylene blue that is injected limits the dissection for us. We know where to end the dissection. Now, once this is done, we take a seromuscular suture <coughs> to completely invert this lesion. We have not made any mucosal breach here. And we put some uh, spacing agents like surgical <coughs> surg cell here to make sure that this lesion becomes prominent on the endoscopy site. And then at the end of the procedure, this is removed endoscopy. <coughs> Now, LES minimizes the surgical margin, securing an adequate distance from the tumor in all directions. This is the biggest advantage of this. And there is a lot of data that is coming up from across the globe to show that these endoscopy and laparoscopy cooperative procedures are becoming popular and they're safer organ preserving with uh, minimal morbidity. There are several pros and cons of all the procedures that I talked to you. I think I'll not go into the details of this, but again, the literature is clearly defined now the role of the endoscopist of the laparoscopic surgeon. So we clearly know what is the procedure, what is the operator's role, which uh, uh, the role of laparoscopic surgeon, the role of endoscopic endoscopist, and wherein both endoscopy and laparoscopy play equally important role. So this is one example, again, the new thing that added to our armamentarium now. This is what we published some time back use of interoperative cytoscopy, wherein uh, peritoneal nodules like this, we stain with methylene 2 and put a scope right on top of that to make an interoperative diagnosis and to get a in vivo uh, uh, histology as compared to the standard histopathological slide. You can see the tumor emboli in this. This is a real-time in vivo histology. So you put the scope directly on the lesion, we'll be able to do this. So we extrapolated this to laparoscopy, and this was the publication that was done some time back. Now, artificial intelligence came in a big way, and then it seemed to have been making big inroads into both endoscopy and laparoscopy. And for the first ever time, we have this instrument called as endobrain, which has got artificial intelligence incorporated into endoscopy. Here, you can, you can see this. This is an endobrain being used. And when you put this lesion scope onto the lesion, it will show you whether it's a neoplastic lesion or a non neoplastic lesion. And it also picks up lesions which are not picked up when you're doing conventional endoscopy. It tells us that you miss some lesion also. So this depends, this, this helps us in treating this patient and it has been collaborated also by uh, biopsies to show that and subsequently at the end of these procedures, it has already been shown that uh, these uh, endoscopic ESDs are being uh, done more and more. And to show the completeness of ESDs, this is being used as an aid. And again, <coughs> it is used to target biopsies like in this patient, it will show you whether you're uh, picking up a lesion because some of the endoscopic biopsies that we do end up with the negative biopsies. So you can see this, this shows invasive cancer. This is invasive cancer again. So this is a big uh, boost to the endoscopist where they started using this endocytoscopy in clinical practice. For the first ever time, again, we use this endobrain on laparoscopic side. This is the patient with uh, metastatic disease, with ascites. So all the investigation is normal. So we had to do a diagnostic laparoscopy to confirm the pathology because others did not yield anything. So we used an endobrain here, again, for the first ever time to see whether it is useful to pick up any lesions and to make an on-table diagnosis of tuberculosis versus malignancy and also to target biopsies. Surprisingly, we are able to see, I'll show you the beautiful images actually. It showed that which is a neoplastic lesion, which is a non-neoplastic lesion. And we are able to make an on-table diagnosis of a malignant module. Uh, and we picked up based on the impression given by this and then subsequently confirmed by histopathology. I'm not saying that this is an alternative, but it shows that what lesions can be targeted, what lesions cannot be targeted. I'm sure like infrared uh, came in a big way into clinical practice. I'm sure artificial intelligence will come in a big way and we'll be using more and more of this artificial intelligence in laparoscopic site. So to conclude the, Mr. Chairman, uh, intraoperative endoscopy is an emerging specialty. 
It aids in forecast surgery by improving the outcomes. It guides and assists endolaparoscopic cooperative surgery. There's an increasing role in, IC, uh, in ICG and IR-related laparoscopic surgery. It aids in function-preserving surgery with oncological safety if educated, experienced, and skilled physicians are available. Technology that minimizes invasive damage to patients and preserve physiological function of residual organs while securing oncological benefit. <coughs> AI endobrain likely to be an important aid can be safely introduced in a facility-based based manner, either by surgeons or endoscopists with advanced skills. As more surgeons are being trained in gastrointestinal endoscopy, the indications and uses will surely expand. <coughs> it requires close cooperation between skilled endoscopists and surgeons. So with the evolution of GI surgery, I'm sure laparoscopy and endoscopy will come together <coughs> and we have a transdible and endoscopic surgery that is going to be a new specialty, emerging specialty, and I'm sure in the days to come, we'll see more and more of this. Thank you so much once again for the patience. Satyapriya, sir. Uh, Satyapriya will be joining shortly. Thank you, Dr. G. V. sir. In fact, uh, it has uh, brought in a different perspective for all of us regarding the usage of gadgets and uh, a totally different dimension towards uh, endoscopists, especially in the era of uh, the uh, reintegration of the medical gastroenterology and surgical gastroenterology together for the welfare of the patient. Uh, may I now have the honor of uh, calling upon the president to give his comments, then we move on to some more questions to Dr. G. Dr. Sunil Sathya. Thank you, Dr. Jivirav. Excellent lecture. Always we are thrilled to see and listen to your lectures because always we come out with new procedures, innovative procedures, innovative ideas. And this was wonderful to see that, uh, and you also mentioned that doing a, a neck surgery with a uh, endoscope inside the esophagus. And that was a thrill to see. Also, many laparoscopic surgery with a GI endoscope inside definitely gives the perspective of both the sides. Another thing is, while doing the open GI surgery, the use of a, a tiny cholangioscope or a pancreatoscope Majority of the people don't use, but if you use, you can definitely find out the unknown tumors which are still there and you can avoid the leak or recurrence immediately after surgery. And uh, TV, after so much of uh, deliberation of intraoperative laparoscopy, what do you think people will be operating after 10 years? Ah, see, actually, people will be operating. There is no idea. There is no doubt about that. But the only thing that I want is surgeons to learn endoscopy, make sure that they don't lose this specialty again uh, to some, somebody else again. So at least we should have some part of endoscopy practice into our clinical armamentarium so that we can be able to uh, capture that area. Otherwise, what happens is uh, with the aggressive, some of the some very aggressive endoscopies, you know, we lost some of these things like we lost ERCP, we lost POEM, you understand? So some surgeons are doing it. But I think this is one sub speciality. I think we should do it actually, which the I mean, the endoscopies will never be able to come out to this side. Yeah, yeah. I would like to listen the comments from our uh, respected past president and trustee, Professor Chaube, sir. Sir, you are muted, sir. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed GV. I think uh, uh, I have been enjoying his talk of notes and starting from, you know, from from the beginning. And I've seen a lot of his videos. It's very interesting and fascinating. And I think GV, your imagination uh, is really to be admired. And uh, how you integrated laparoscopy and endoscopy is quite remarkable. And I think is the way forward. And uh, uh, I quite agree with you that uh, laparoscopy and endoscopy or endolaparoscopy is a big way forward and it will make 1 plus 1 into 11. I think uh, this is definitely, uh, and also if you re recollect the last slide which I showed, this is what now 
we feel proud that we have got at max uh, the center for uh, hepatobiliary and uh, gi uh, sciences including liver transplant and we have got a third space uh, endoscopist dr vikas singla and his team so i think this is the way forward and you have always guided uh, the surgeons and the endoscopist uh, and also promoted their union and synergy so congratulations and i i think all of us we should try to follow as far as possible this model of uh, uh, laparoscopy thank you sir jv in spite of uh, you know we the surgeons doing many of us are doing lot of gi endoscopies and you are being a role model for a surgeon to be endoscopist in the teaching curriculum still any of citizens has still uh, included gi endoscopy in the part of surgical teaching what is your thought on that yeah <coughs> yeah very right actually uh, now so actually if you see the curriculum of any ms general surgery of any medical college you take a pol india institute of medical sciences of pgi endoscopy is part and parcel of the thing so it is not being done but i think the ms general surgery students have every right to ask that it is part and parcel of their curriculum even for the mch and dnb gi surgery there has been a recent modification of the entire curriculum where it becomes mandatory that all surgeons are trained in some amount of endoscopy to do this advanced surgical procedures and uh, uh, see it, it is not if you see at least 80% of the endoscopy seen even in us for the periphery are surgeons doing endoscopy it is only those 20% of the endoscopists who are practicing in metros who are practicing this advanced surgery. But the screening colonoscopy in US is all done by German surgeons. So I mean, I mean, here, it, it is not a competition, but I think it, it all depends on where you are practicing. Obviously, if you are practicing in a corporate hospital, you are not allowed to do it. But Sunil, you rightly said, actually, in your place, you can practice both endoscopy and endoscopy. Nobody asks you. As long as we are all certified. Yeah. Maybe. one important thing i this was a dream run suddenly i got disconnected at the exact last moment i remember you were saying this thing that it has to be a new specialist for that is me i think one thing we have done in west bengal very good thing all the 22 medical colleges government the surgery department has its own upper and colonoscopy yeah, absolutely all the medical for last two years i was working on it for one decade With the chief minister now he has given, and now every PG, such as MSCG, can have access to that at least diagnostic. Uh, what do you think? Should it be replicated in all states? I think I should congratulate you, Sanjay, uh, for uh, this, this excellent in initiative. I know your role model actually. I know how much of uh, I know how much of uh, this thing that you have to use to get an endoscope and a colonoscopy to the theater. Uh, that was the pub <coughs> public sector. In, uh, that is incredible. I think everybody should make it a point to make at least an upper GI and a colonoscope should be there in the theater complex. It should be. We, we cannot be asking our endoscopists to come and do the procedure every time we do a procedure. We should learn our own this thing. It's a great this thing initiative from your side. I think yours is the only thing on the public sector first, which is what the complete set on the theater side. Congratulations for that initiative. No, thanks a lot. Even government medical college in West Bengal, they are having the surgery yes. department having separate the these things. I think it's a great thing if they can listen to these things. Those who are listening, they can understand how good it can be. Yes. At least after cardiomyopathy, to do a leak case by endoscopically, we should not fall somewhere. Yeah. We are detecting a benign uh, polyp difficult. We should do the colonoscopy and help our yeah, polyp yeah. to detect that. And uh, this ICG, this was the answer. Excellent concept of the malignancy to be intralesion, and then look for how nicely the lymph nodes and others were looking into that. Have you any plan of starting any fellowship of this interventional? Uh, no, actually, uh, people who are trained with us, the DNP surgical gastro people are all trained in procedures. Actually, from my side, actually, I made sure that they are trained because they may not get some endoscopy training on the endoscopy side because. They almost have sixteen DNP students every year there. So, I mean, I mean, we do almost about forty percent of work on the theater involves some amount of endoscopy. Oh. So we make sure that the surgical residents do that endoscopy part. Actually, in fact, actually, 
one of my surgical resident does the impropriety. He is involved in a trial of impropriety pancreatoscopy right now. Oh, uh, with Boston Scientific actually. That makes it give them some incentive to work actually. So he is involved in that impropriety pancreatoscopy, which I think is going to come into the guidelines for management of IPM. Fantastic, actually. I must always say the dream run and is a real lesson for everyone delegates who are listening to me that this is achieved in India in our very near and model center under you. We all look forward to, to guide us all and going into more and more surgeons into more endoscopic things. Your residents are doing pancreatoscopy. That's a fantastic message for everyone. Thank you, Satyapriya. Thank you, GV. Uh, we have our president-elect and organizing chairman, Dr. Thangavalu, here from Coimbatore. Welcome, Dr. Thangavalu. Before you joined, uh, Professor Chobe was asking me, Sunil, what is the situation in Coimbatore? So it's good that you have joined. So uh, I welcome you to this podium and uh, please invite everybody and share your thoughts on what are the situation, what is the situation going to uh, Good evening, uh, uh, President. Good evening, sir. Uh, Chaupe, sir. Good evening, Rao and uh, my Satya uh, uh, Dr. Um, well. um, see, when I am, when I am uh, moving towards a target, I don't uh, look right or left. I only target is uh, my aim. Of course, you know, uh, there are uh, problems here and there, but Coimbatore is uh, reasonably okay now. Let us see. I am waiting for a uh, uh, few more days. And then, uh, I, until then, I will not change uh, my idea of uh, organizing a physical conference. I hope you all cooperate with me. And thing is, everybody is vaccinated, and even uh, the audio video people also we are vaccinated, and uh, we have insisted that the water people should be vaccinated. So it's a huge space that the five star hotel is a twenty thousand square foot uh, huge space. We can. Uh, uh, Adopt all the COVID uh, appropriate, uh, what is that term called? COVID appropriate behavior. Huh? COVID yeah. appropriate behavior. Yeah. <laughs> That's a new terminology. That, uh, that is possible there, very much possible there. So, as of now, I have not changed my mind. I have not given up anything. So, only thing I need, uh, I have already uh, requested a uh, uh, Chaube, sir, uh, and he has extended his fullest cooperation. I spoke many times to Mr. G.V. Rao, and he also promised me to uh, spare all the three days to go, uh, to go in with those. So, without any hesitation, I am going right now. Let me see how things will move. And, uh, many things are not in our hands, you know. Uh, we plan and uh, ultimately God disposes this. I am having a lot of faith in God. So let me see how it works. So, whatever it, uh, it may be, I need all your cooperation. And uh, as far as uh, today's uh, this prime time concern, it's really a good prime time. I, <laughs> I don't know who kind of a uh, Word this prime prime time I A D E S. He he uh, deserve great applause uh, for that. Uh, really, uh, two giants. Uh, Pradeep Chaube is my inspiration in laparoscopy. I have a lot of respect. Uh, ever since I met him, some maybe some ninety two or ninety three, I am uh, inspired by him. And it, uh, you know, he is training, teaching, he is uh, spent all his time for that only. So that inspired me, not only me, many young, including my uh, son is inspired by him. Maybe my grandson also. <laughs> <inspired by him. laughs> 
today is uh, lecture i i don't need to say anything as usual it is uh, it was fantastic and uh, as far as gv is a great man these are all the days of alliances especially only tamil nadu elections are over i think west bengal also election these are all the days of alliances forming government but this alliance this endoscopy and laparoscopy alliance is uh, will never <laughs> fail it is always uh, will win and uh, will be successful and it will reach uh, i think uh, gv has a great dream all your dreams will be uh, fulfilled will be realized uh, this rock so with these few words uh, it's a nice opportunity i am very fortunate to listen to these two great stalwarts i extend once again my uh, uh, welcome uh, to coimbatore for the conference and make the conference a great memorable one thank you so much thank you dr thangavelu thanagwel over to you thank you sir uh, thank you all the senior faculty uh, can i have the honor of inviting our honorary secretary dr ishwar moti sir to share his thoughts and uh, give his vote of thanks please over to you dr ishwar moti sir thank you thank you president thank you kanakavel friends ladies and gentlemen let me bring greetings from iags office with all our ec members assembled here i'm sure thanks to smith sa and also satyapriya my friend i think we are very fortunate to bring two great personalities today in this iags prime time season 2 session 2 i think uh, batmasri professor pradeep chobe gave a scintillating talk on evolution of minimal access surgery for hernia and uh, followed by dr gb on intraoperative endoscopy is a topic close to our heart as an endoscopic surgeon i think every surgeon listen to this lecture should realize that surgery with a flexible endoscopy platform is the future so let us start learning or continue to learn not only in yourselves and iig is also providing as courses both in the basic and advanced flexible endoscopy training courses in the way of efags and fogi thanks to our president as i said thank you all we had a great day and i think uh, what our uh, organizing chairman was telling we are all vaccinated i am sure you will be looking forward in spite of the covid second wave i think and the odds are on our side we'll look forward in the meantime we if from iigs continue our academic journey both in the on site format in fags katak and trivandrum and online fags people interested please log in our new face website if you can dog i can home page will have all the details wherever you want to join iigs pamitur 2021 pamitur katak trivandrum all the calendars will be there for you on a click up a button please do and i also with a folded hand invite you along with the dr lpt to come to this very safe five star ambience to enjoy in the presence of all this international and a national faculties so till that time thank you kanagavel thank you doc pluses for another edition of online academic blockbuster thank you good night jai hind thank you everybody good night good night thank you dear faculty uh, thank you friends uh, from the country and out of the country for joining us today i am sure uh, endoscopy and laparoscopy are the brothers and sisters of the family of gastroenterology sibling rivalry are going to be there but for all for the welfare of the family of the gastroenterology with that few words i call this session a close i once again thank the president for giving me the opportunity to host yet another important event for the iags i thank uh, pradeep sir jv sir sumit sir uh, satyapriya sir and our president elect for giving a very good view point of the current situation and uh, thank you sir for welcoming all of us to coi iags thank you ishwar sir for giving your uh, vote of thanks we look forward to have all of you for yet another important edition in a fortnight time from now thank you one and all jai hind good night nathan